there is this hesitancy to talk about ourselves what we have done and also there is this constant self doubt it was almost like a shock for me and i had little or no confidence to just but i, I was thrown out there so i had to deal with everything we need people who are actually skilled for the job and someone who won't be afraid to stand up to them and say that this is wrong we need to change uh, the way you're looking at things when you have bad yeah. news when you're going through a rough time you should be able to pick up the phone and have that frank talk or even a venting session yeah. with your investor that's the kind of relationship you that's one of the biggest uh, things i have learned in life that i have to be uh, to use your words I need to be selfish to be able to really give and to be selfless. Welcome to the 6th episode of the Life Boat. This time I'm thrilled to bring another dear friend of mine and an amazing investor who has all it takes to be a thunderbolt. Let me welcome Amrita Barthagur, partner and the chief operating officer of Sama Capital. Amrita welcomed us to her office, a place where she feels very comfortable and motivated to be unstoppable. Or maybe that was a statement she made because she had her house under renovation and didn't want to invite me there. Who knows? Now, Amrita is a bit camera shy. and thodi nervous with you while talking her heart out but this didn't stop her from giving the best insights we delved into the early life of amrita her mental recalibration kaise failures a entrepreneurial journey ke liye bahut zyada important hote hain and how to deal with it wo jugar wo hasil aakhir hota kya hai fomo management what is that kaise kare ek insaan manage and much much more which not only are inspiration but also depicts the true essence of the life boat sit back enjoy the episode kuch sikhe isse kuch implement kijiye isse and keep building one step at a time watch like share and subscribe kijiye's channel go and let us know how this episode helped you welcome to the life boat let's dive in thank you thank you for making this happen thank you for inviting me to your beautiful office where i have been on several occasions earlier but not like this where this is a very very core part of my heart what i'm doing and a lot of people who i bring in are people amrita who are like you super achievers amazing people who have built who have created who have made a name for themselves right from the scratch and yet people who are not willing to talk too much about it not willing to go tom tom about it not willing to go across and have that vociferous microphone and speak in all forums because i think that's what makes it so special and that's what makes life boat worthy enough to have people like you so thank you so much amrita for going across and being a part of life boat thank you for welcoming to your office to your heart and for having this conversation Thank you so much for making me a part of this passion project of yours. I am honored and I'm really really happy that uh, I I don't normally talk about myself. I'm not comfortable, but I am really happy that I we both agreed to do this. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I guess that's where I I can I can be very proud and say that um, a part of that agreement is also because of the relationship you and I share. and uh, friendship i think comes with that ability of taking that little bit of advantage of each other and i have uh, definitely taken full advantage to make sure that unwillingly you're still here <laughs> and at the end of it i'm hoping that willingly you'll say that this is one of the best conversations that you ever had so we start with one very important thing that you straight away said right and i see this a lot happening with a lot of my friends who are women who are super achievers again who have actually been or are currently in one of the top notch grades of their pyramids that they have created but they still come with the same thought to say that we are not comfortable talking about it so i straight away want to pounce into this first because the idea of lifeboat 
is to do a lot of learnings through this conversation and those learnings for our viewers to become their life boat moments. Because our viewers are people who are perhaps at that age group where there's a lot of impressionable age that will happen. And the idea is for them to learn from people who they see in their regular lives as potential heroes, potential heroines, potential stars that they want to go across and factor in. So tell me, why is it difficult to talk about all that you have achieved in spite of the fact that you're one of the rarest people in this country who have seen wear so many hats together? I'll be very frank. Um, it's not that I don't, it's not so much that I don't want to talk about it, but it's, it's a genuine belief that probably I have not achieved so much, you know. I, there's that feeling inside me that I, I don't know where it comes from and why, but I'm not sure if I have done enough for people to look up to me for advice or have I really done enough for me to be able to give advice to people. So, and you know, since you brought up that women topic, I think this is a problem a lot of us have. There is, I mean, all through my journey, whether it was in the law firms or now at Sama, there is this hesitancy to talk about ourselves, what we have done. And also there is this constant self-doubt that what I'm thinking of, what my opinion is, is probably not the right opinion. Maybe I shouldn't speak up. Maybe I'll sound stupid. There's that constant questioning. And I've been working for like how many decades now, but I still have that doubt. So let me, let me add address this with two aspects of thought. One, the normal uh, mindset of people would be that, oh, she's being so humble. You know, she's, she's being modest. Uh, here is someone who started career as a lawyer, uh, went on from being a lawyer to an in-house counsel, went on from being an in-house counsel to wear the hat of a deal maker, went on to becoming in the operations went on to wear the investor hat to now take decisions as an investor, became a partner in a fund which in India is perhaps one of the best names in the sector that the fund invests in. So it's very easy for people to say, isne to itna kuch macha liya, itna kuch kar liya. she's done so much, so it's so easy for her to say it, that she's actually achieved nothing, she's just playing the humility card and the modesty card. The other way to look at it, is also say that this perhaps is the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Now, I want to go a little deeper. Is it that this imposter syndrome or this mindset comes from how one's childhood is shaped up? How early stage development in life is? How early stage situations in life is? How early stage trauma hits your life? Because I I'm a firm believer and uh, not because I try to talk about this from an angle of some kind of a rendezvous episode, but I genuinely believe, Amrita, that the harder is your journey, the stronger you emerge. Baptism by fire is what makes you what you are. So take us back to that childhood. A lot of people must believe with the way you come across, the way your public persona is, the way what news and social media has about you, that life would have been plain vanilla, life would have been super, super, super easy, super background, extremely well-connected background, very well-renowned family. But there were, I'm sure, enough episodes for you to take back and say that here are certain things that shaped the character that I am today. And perhaps few of those are the seeds of either humility or imposter syndrome, whichever it is. So take us back to that journey. I would say it is a combination. Childhood, I have great memories because we started off in this joint family and even after the joint family split up, there was always like all my cousins, everyone. So like when I look back, it's just constant people in the house, lot of warmth, lot of uh, laughter. My dad, like we are two sisters, so he always made us believe that we can do whatever. And we come from the Northeast where 
you know women are really empowered in the true sense of the word so those issues were not there but i do believe that because um the it, now things are changing but at that time we did not have that many opportunities in the northeast so i think a lot of the things that like my kids today are exposed to that is making them confident and believe that they can go out there and do whatever they want to we didn't get those opportunities so while and i have led a very protected life so when i came out to study and then to work it was almost like a shock for me and i had little or no confidence to just but i i was thrown out there so i had to deal with everything um family was always there to support me at some level i also think my sister is the super achiever in the family really i mean she is just this genius who's always done like she stopped she's achieved everything in life really really well and so i was like okay she is the older one that burden lies on her i can just chill and have fun so i think i was a little laid back when i was a child so that just continues but uh seriously speaking i think that lack of opportunities was an issue and also uh, you'll hear a lot about my dad since this is about life boat i have always seen him just working 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 and he was someone who always believed that you work don't worry about the results and he was not someone who would clamor for you know recognition or i just saw him working hard ultimately he did get recognized but that's not because he went after it and i think somewhere it's there in my mind and i also function that way i i don't believe in talking too much and um, self doubt i don't know i think it's it's the lack of opportunities during the initial years so when when someone comes out of a very uh, protected environment when someone comes out of that uh, you know that uh, boundary where there's so much of comfort there is also a situation to say that now it's about sink or swim right mentally a lot of recalibration has to be done a lot of people may also say that you know mental recalibration from and i'm going to ask very honest and very candid thought processes right because one thought in mind is that if you come from a privileged background and privilege of course because of the hard work of your family hard work of the uh, you know parents but when you come from a privileged background even dealing with those situations of sink and swim is far easier because the essence of options of life boats is far stronger versus if you came from a not so privileged background but a lot of people don't under or maybe undermine they don't understand and they underestimate that there's also an aspect of mental wellness which today a lot of people are talking about in our generation and the age that we are from there were a lot of things that we had to deal, deal with and the demons that we had to deal with were all inner and at our end so if today you have to go back and say that how you shaped up tell us a girl from northeast a girl from assam coming out and again why i ask this because in a way you are like a poster child and a destiny's child if i may say so for a lot of people to say that this is something that we want to have we want to we want to achieve because if someone as real as you can do it we can do it coming out of northeast getting into a decent law school getting into a decent law firm moving on the rungs rather than dealing with those institutions i want to deal with that mindset every time when challenges would come in how would you recalibrate that mind of that little girl to come back and say that mindset is everything lot of people underestimate mindset you know circumstances can have gravity circumstances can have springboard they can pull you down they can push you up the mindset is what has to calibrate everything to say that we are stable so take us through the evolution of that little girl from northeast to one of the most talked about people in from a gender perspective as women in private equity in venture capital today how has the mindset evolved 
go a little granular on your mindset so um childhood like i said was very very protected i didn't have to think about anything i didn't have to worry about anything my dad really took care of everything my mom my sister um so when i came out there was this thing in my head that i have to make it by myself it has to be me who's doing it not because my dad is making a phone call or you know my sister is telling me that this is how you should be doing it or whatever so that was there but just to take a step back i got married really early at 1920 this was my first marriage uh much against my parents wish of course they supported me when they knew that i was really hellbent on getting married but um they did try to talk me out of it i did go ahead and get married so i'm talking about this because of the whole mindset question that you asked so after many years i decided to walk out of that marriage so two three things here one is on the mindset question for most people and especially our society they would probably look at this as a failed marriage she failed i don't look at it that way you know i look at it as a marriage from where i have my two beautiful kids how can that be a failure right i learned to be independent during those years i because i didn't want to go running to my parents crying every time there was an issue or i had to deal with something so i really learned like it was like what you said i was thrown out there i had to learn to swim there was no way out so i really learned to take care of myself to take care of my kids and um, so i i was always someone who wanted to just be at home take care of my family not work my mom and my sister feared that i will do something like that and they kept telling me that there is no way we will agree to this marriage provided you come i was in my third year when i got married so provided you complete your studies and you work and they made sure i worked and i'm eternally grateful for that because if i was not financially independent i couldn't have walked out of that marriage it's not like it was a bad marriage or anything whatever we grew apart but it happens i had that ability to make that decision for myself and for my kids because i was financially independent and for all the women out there i think that's the biggest message from me and because of all these learnings from that marriage i don't take that as a failure i think things happen for a reason i think everything happens at the right time you know whatever is supposed to happen and you need to accept it and i think that's the mindset which has really helped me so one is that not really looking back at failures and getting me getting them you know to really yeah. to get me down but instead just taking the learnings and moving on i just keep move, moving forward i think I mean all of us keep facing failures on a daily basis. True. Whether it's something as small as feeling that I have failed as a parent that's a constant guilt in my head. So you have to just keep moving forward and keep working hard. That's the other thing. I think hard work that's you cannot avoid that. It's even to their sama. I think you work hard, you don't have to talk ultimately your work is going to talk about what you have achieved or not achieved or whatever so these two things and then the third thing is also um uh, and this has come with age um uh, to accept things and since you're talking about evolution earlier when i started working i started i came out of the northeast to study to work it was like constant no no how can this happen i have to change it i i need to control everything now with age i have learned to just accept a lot of things and just go with the flow because if i don't do that i am not happy i am not 
at peace with myself and when I'm not then I can't give the way I want to give to my family and to my job so I think that's been sort of the evolution and the three main factors or from the mindset perspective one is of course not looking at anything as a failure I don't second is hard work just pure hard work and third is accepting that acceptance of things and understanding that things happen for a reason and they'll, they'll all fall in place yes, yes yes you know so i keep saying this um for me one of the biggest things about failure is and without going into any cliche construct we all will continue to fail we will always fail we can't avoid failure in different aspects of life what is important is can we fail better every time yes and people don't understand the power of failing better because when you fail better every time the margin of error in your mind in terms of that issue keeps reducing True. and that i think is one of the biggest equalizers in your mindset of trying to always bring in that essence of overachieving saying you know it's not enough i want to do things in a particular way it it creates that internal mindset which which is not peaceful what you spoke about also in terms of the third bit which is very important is when you accept things in a particular manner somewhere there's a derivative of also being content mm. hard work to my mind there is no substitute because you know no matter what everything that we have done in our lives it it hard work there is no substitute but these aspects of maturity to say that if you can fail better to aspect of maturity to understand that the derivative of being content has so much more added elements that just pass on and create so let's go a little more in you know in uh, in a little more in lighter zone uh we also know that in a journey of building a career there are lots of times nuances that one sees and one decides that this is what i'm meant to do this is what i'm not meant to do now that could be very clear for some people for some people there could be a huge dichotomy in mind especially when you come with the mindset of saying that i originally did not want to go across and work i wanted to just take care of family be happy be content so in a way that fire that overt hunger that overt construct of saying yaar mujhe machana hai mujhe kuch karna hai mujhe constantly have to prove something as it is something which you have to work far harder on to dwell and prong but when you come to a stage in life where you are now moving from the role of a service provider to the role of the service recipient and then moving from being a support system to business and decision how difficult is mental recalibration there for people in the business sense to say here is a person who i knew as a lawyer and suddenly coming and trying to teach me how investment should be done or here is a person who's trying to giving me gyan as to what a founder needs to look at yaar isko to contract dekhna chahiye tha why is this person going around talking about intangible elements because intangible elements a, a, a professional should not talk about so how did you deal with that recalibration and how do you see industry today evolving for women in vc women in p perhaps you play a very very interesting role right because a lot of women who are your friends who are doing very well are directly in the industry bases their background and they are not professionals turned into investors or professionals entering the business zone or the business role you are a rarity you manage to go and and in professional services a lot of people call it that you broke the glass ceiling in a very different manner how was recalibrating that how was the ability to change dynamics there how easily was your voice heard on a board how easily was your voice heard in a room so i'll take the last point first okay by nature i'm not someone who can talk too loudly or talk too much unless i am yeah i can talk a lot if i feel very passionately about something but not not uh, usually initially of course i realized that i kept making my points i was not heard it was usually lot of times a room full of men 
मे बी आई एम द ओनली वुमेन अन आदर वन मे बी बट स्लोली आई रियलाइज दैट आई डेंट हैव टू रेज माई वॉइस एज लॉन्ग एज आफ्टर सम टाइम पीपल रियलाइज दैट ओके शी इज टॉकिंग सेंस यू आर हर्ड इट्स ओके यू डोंट नीड टू रेज योर वॉइस यू डोंट नीड टू टॉक जस्ट फॉर द सेक ऑफ टॉकिंग इफ यू आर मेकिंग सेंस अल्टीमेटली यू विल बी हर्ड that is something i have realized but yes being a woman and now also i mean i attend all these events etc you can count the number of women in your hand you know it's one hand sometimes it's it's not how it should be but i'm seeing more and more uh, you know women joining the vcp industry and doing really well so things have changed they are changing and definitely definitely much better than when i had started off now coming to your point of transition i think it was um, very natural i've been with sama for more than a decade now so even before sama uh, when i was at nda they were my clients and uh, i was used to handling all the transactions and taking a lot of decisions even though i was just a service provider so I had already known how Sama functions, how Ash Lilani thinks, and that helped when I joined in house. And um, it was a very natural progression in that sense, probably because the team is smaller, and Ash has been not just Ash, my entire team, our entire team here has been very supportive. and constantly helping me to reinvent myself myself and encouraging me to you know take on this i was always part of the ic meetings i you know constantly would hear what their thought process is in making an investment decision exit decisions so i was always part of it so you know i don't know how it happened it wasn't even like okay from today onwards you are going to take this on it was a very natural progression because i i have always been very involved with our portfolio companies they have uh, ash has always given me uh, complete freedom to you know talk to our founders in fact you are blamed at times to be overtly emotional about your portfolios as well i am i am i get very very emotional does that does that ever color your judgment does it I, ever color a decision a thought i think it does it does quite a bit I get very emotionally involved, and that is something I'm still learning from Ash, who's one of the most empathetic and high EQ person I have ever met. But because of his experience, he's learned to comp- compartmentalize the two, and that is something I'm still learning from him. Uh, it is difficult many times. So you refer to a very interesting term. which i believe is the fulcrum and pillar of sanity personally i believe that and that term is called compartmentalization so i'm going to deep a little uh, or dig a little deeper in terms of what this means do you think therefore and i'm going to give you a you know situation and a scenario and maybe that's something a lot of our viewers can also take back to say that it's very easy to get sucked into the emotion of building i ask this because you see new age entrepreneurs on a day in day out basis you see them with their hutspa you see them with their emotion you see them with that twinkle and spark in their eye you see them with that that aggression to say that they'll go and conquer the entire world because you also see them at a very early stage you're typically amongst the first and the second institutional investor coming on a cap table so you see that dream taking shape like there's a lot of tangibility Now in that zone it's very easy for someone to get sucked into multiple emotions now those emotions could be of hubris those emotions could be of nonchalance those emotions could be of self doubt those emotions could be of impractical vision and impractical alignment of asks but they are all stemming out of the core of that person there i believe therefore in life it's very important to live a life of compartments and when i say life of compartments i believe one of the worst things that we can do is stop being selfish at times 
one of the best things that you can do at times to yourself and one of the most selfless things that you can do is to be selfish. So when you compartmentalize, be it with respect to people, family, spouse, partners, co-founders, friends, you manage to create a compartment called me. And that is that zone where a person can introspect. That is the zone where a person can hear his or her inner voices. Now, do you believe therefore, personally, are you a person who manages to compartmentalize at all? Does that allow you to therefore have a thought process? And does that somehow have some kind of a bearing on your investment decisions as well? Or how you deal with founders and you treat founders or you discuss with founders, does that have a bearing? Do you believe that also a lot of young founders should definitely create compartments to say that that zone of their own compartment allows them to take that two step back and take an eagle's eye view on what they are building and perhaps leave that emotion aside and look at pragmatism because in long term for sustainable businesses beyond emotion it's also pragmatism that allows it so how do you look into this i totally agree with you it's super important to compartmentalize and the last sentence you said about sustaining being able to sustain over the long term i think that's very important i'm not good at it at all this is my husband vijay he is excellent and he keeps telling me this you know exactly what you said that you need to be able to compartmentalize otherwise it takes a toll on you and uh, I think though I'm not the right person to give this advice because I am very bad at it but I do think it is something I want to do so I definitely think it is important for especially founders because they have such stressful lives and um, because a lot of times they get so attached to their idea to their product it is extremely important to be able to take that step back and say that okay so some of her most successful uh, investments if you see whether it's even some like paytm i mean it was 197 which was something completely different from when we exited right so most of our successful founders and companies if i look back they are people who have been able to been able to you know take that step back and pivot and say that no i cannot be so attached to my idea or my product or my company if i need to pivot if i need to make certain changes i should be able to do that and keep my emotional attachments aside so i do think it is super important and something i am really trying to do uh, and the second point i you made is about being selfish right again something uh, very important something I have been trying to inculcate in the last two three years where I try to find some me time because I have realized and this is since we are talking about founders I think it is super important especially for founders with the kind of stressful lives they lead it's important to find that time like I love painting I'm not good at it but it's very therapeutic so I now just try to find some time to go to a workshop, just paint, forget about my family, forget about everyone and just spend that time with myself. I went and watched Rocky or Rani all by myself, even though my husband wanted to go, my kids wanted to go. But the first time I went by myself because I just wanted that me time just to. And I think that's super important. You need. I think it's critical. It is. It is. It's critical. And that's one of the biggest uh, things I have learned in life that I have to be, to use your words, I need to be selfish to be able to really give and to be selfless. In fact, being selfless to yourself is by being selfish for yourself because that's the way. And I believe not just as founders, investors, as individuals, we all have so many people attached around us. Yeah. We have so many people depending on us. For you to constantly give that 100%, it takes out of you. Absolutely. It's it extracts exhausting. out of you. It's exhausting. So this is one way yeah. I believe that we all need to recalibrate. All the more younger founders, because 
they are living breathing dreaming every moment about what they're trying to do and at times that also can completely make them lose it in the long term that might become very difficult पानी का आवाज आ रहा है कुछ तो आवाज़ आ रहा है इसलिए रोलिंग से पहले तुम आवाज चेक कर लो तो बीच में फ्लो होगा तुम काटोगे ना ये बहुत गाली देगी तुम्हें आई वॉन्ट डील विद वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट एंड आई हैव सीन दिस अलॉट why you are the perfect person to ask this is because you've also seen tremendous amount of success on some of your portfolios you've seen founders where you betted on them when they were nobody to become reasonably well known celebrated names some of them are fantastic they are very grounded but we've also seen a lot of people off late where they get a little bit of success or they taste a little bit of success and they immediately have a sense of hubris that comes in and suddenly ये लोग जमीन से दो कदम ऊपर चल रहे एंड समटाइम्स आई थिंक दैट्स द फर्स्ट वार्निंग साइन बिकॉज एज अ फाउंडर इट शुड ऑलवेज बी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ओवर सेल्फ वी ओवर आई बट द मोमेंट ह्यूब्रिस सेट्स इन और द गॉड सिंड्रम सेट्स इन इट इज अबाउट आई ओवर वी इट इज अ मी ओवर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हाउ डज अ फाउंडर और राधा हाउ शुड अ फाउंडर do hubris management you would have faced several situations amrita behar you would have seen the most grounded of founders building and still staying grounded and also simultaneously seen warning signs maybe on some founders who say that maybe they are going going in the direct or in the right direction that it should and because you've seen the journey with a 360 degree view you also know where the khai is and you know where the pothole is or where the person is going to fall how does a founder manage this ego what's your advice in your experience how have you seen it what would you advise young founders in terms of hubris management i know i think uh, the moment you feel one is of course you if you have seasoned investors on board you have mentors who are pointing this out to you listen to them there is obviously some uh, wisdom in what they are saying it you shouldn't just ignore and think that you know it all and you know you're doing it all well and you don't have to listen to anyone i think those are the first warning signs how your team is behaving with you whether you're able to retain your teams what your investor your board is telling you what your mentors are telling you so i think just making sure you listen to them listen to those warnings and act on them not think that oh you are god now and you can achieve whatever because as you said that always you you will always have a fall after 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 that so i think but how easy is it to, it's it's not easy um, and we have faced situations where uh, the founders have ignored all sorts of you know advice from different people and still gone ahead and you know behave the way they thought they should uh and the consequences were there very soon so i think it's important for founders to support them uh, sorry surround themselves with uh people who are not scared to point out to them that show them it up yes i think that is important and family also plays a very important role there you know the you need to have that support and someone who can tell you that look stay grounded yeah stay grounded i think surrounding yourself with the right people even the senior team members who can show you the mirror i think that's important and listen to your mentors listen to the investors they probably there is some wisdom because uh, they have invested in so many companies we have seen so many of these things play out over so many years so when we tell you that look something's wrong it's it's always a pay heed yeah listen early on not not when it's too late and you know but i think a lot of it is also character trait it is in that case there is we've seen not much can be done not much can be done you 
picked up a very important point at the very beginning of our conversation and you said that even right now when you're speaking you were nervous i still am <laughs> now i'm saying now you're not i'm sure you got you got a little comfortable i hope i've managed to you know make that happen but i want to de- you know deal with something very very important and very relevant and that is the power of pretense so i'll give you an example so you know recently archana uh, my wife in her ted talk she made a very interesting observation and one of the things that she had said in her observation was that right now on the stage i am shivering right now on the stage i am shitting bricks but can i let you know that i can't yeah because for me if i let you know that i can't continue to talk so pretense at times is your biggest armor fake it till you make it fake it till you make it i want you to marry this thought with two aspects that i ask you one specifically with respect to you as a woman and the fact that you've seen so many women not just women entrepreneurs successful entrepreneurs successful women in investors and also when you look at it in terms of advising young founders because that's also something that you keep seeing marry this thought to say that is fake it till you make it overrated is pretense being an armor a strength or is acknowledging pretense is an armor stating it out proudly so that that pretense of or the need for pretense beyond a point goes away because the moment you state it you don't need to pretend the moment you said you're nervous you don't need to pretend any more not to be nervous and that i think is extremely powerful honestly because you're saying this in front of four cameras you're saying this in front of crew you're saying this in front of or in a content which you know will be seen by several people so what is the power of pretense and what is the ability of acknowledging pretense so that the need stops take this take our take us through take us through this mindset and this conundrum that lot of people face mostly again i i i i don't want to sound you know that i'm trying to emphasize only that women face it i think it is quite gender agnostic honestly but i hear this more from women because i think the male ego does not even permit people to accept yeah. it Firstly, I do. Th- I mean, when I see Vijay, my husband, talk, he loves. I think you are also someone who loves to talk, public speaking. It comes naturally, you know. And that maybe it does, is, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. At least that's how, <laughs> <laughs> that's how you guys, uh, you know, pretend. I don't know. So. Uh, see archana speaking and saying that at at the ted talk or me saying it now is a very different situation i'm sitting here talking about my life or what i have failed at what i have achieved i have worked for many years i've reached a certain stage where probably it doesn't matter to me so much what people think or i know that i will anyway get certain opportunities at this stage uh, or same with archana but if i look back to me at say nishadesa associates which is where i realized the importance of appearing confident and nishad bhai gave me so many opportunities my initial reaction always would be that no i i can't go and speak there how how will i speak in such a huge forum etc he didn't give up on me i also didn't give up on myself i would practice rehearse still be so scared but i did it i i pretended that i was confident i would go and give all these talks and speeches and you know give my views in a room full of people it was pretense it still is to a large extent but now i can also confidently say that oh i'm so nervous it's almost like it's okay i am nervous i'm confident enough to accept that i'm nervous and that's very powerful i know it's 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 two very contradictory words but that's when i'm now i couldn't have done that 
Yeah, people will not. Yeah, back. people won't don't understand the depth of what you're just saying. You know, the, what you're saying is so deep and so powerful, because to have the confidence to say that you're scared, it sounds contradictory, but it actually talks about how comfortable now you are within yeah. your own skin. And I think one of the biggest aspects to be able to build something is to know who you are, what you are, what matters to you, what your inner DNA and fabric is, and to acknowledge and accept it. The day you accept it, from there onwards, you can only keep building on it. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. And uh, one more point, since you mentioned founders and women, and this is something we see with our women founders very often. I see it with myself as well, especially if there is a male, whether husband or partner, business partner or whatever. The moment something comes up about data or numbers, so they'll speak very passionately about the product, the moment there is something about data or numbers, they look at their male colleague. Yeah. Shouldn't be like that. You should know at least, and you should be able to talk at least broad numbers, broad data of what's happening in your business. You know, and you probably know it, but that fear is there. That self-doubt is there. Yeah, self-doubt is there. So it's it's important to, I think, Take ownership. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Now, let's go into one more facet. There have been times where you've been at the lowest barrel of the, you know, I call it the bottom of the barrel moment. That bat bottom of the barrel moment can be because of personal loss. It could be because of uh, personal situations and trauma that one goes through. Today, I'm very, very grateful that you spoke about your first marriage because I knew it, but the world doesn't, right? And the world doesn't know about how you dealt with it. There was another incident that happened recently, and I know that you've still not been able to perhaps acknowledge and deal with that problem. But that is a bottom of the barrel moment. I've had several bottom of the barrel moments. I'm very fortunate that I've not had bottom of the barrel moments with respect to death of a near and a dear one but i've had bottom of the barrel moments in terms of where my mental sanity my mental wellness my mental acceptance of me being the way it is could have got questioned one thing that i recalibrated at that time is that when you're at that bottom if you acknowledge and accept it and it goes back to what you stated a little while earlier, that learn to accept the situation that you're in. So if you learn to accept that that is the bottom most moment, the only direction from there onwards will be up. Yeah. But that power to accept and therefore recalibrate the mind to again look at it optimistically. How difficult is it? They say entrepreneurs are eternally optimist. I personally believe because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing otherwise if I wasn't, honestly. And I've gone through my own journey. You, you're aware of some of it as a very dear friend of mine. But how difficult is it to recalibrate that mindset to say that in respect of the shit that I'm dealing with, I recognize this is my bottom most. And from here onwards, I can only go up. Take, take us through that mindset and give your thought and context of advice to a lot of our viewers who would be in that very, very, you know, perceptive, very impressionable age where they are going through their calls, their decisions, their thought process and maybe they be believe that that's the worst moment for them because they're failing. And yet they don't know going forward that there's a new sunrise on another day. So take us through that. No, I think, I think that's very important and I keep telling my kids this, that you think this is, and you know, at that age, even small things can, you know, appear like it's, oh, my life has ended. I sometimes I take out my diaries from my school days and I laugh at myself because at the, during those teenage years, something so small would, you know, I have written things like, oh, my life has ended today, that kind of stuff, right? 
and that's how you think at that age uh, so i think now i have realized that uh, everything passes you will survive and you will live to see another day and hopefully a better day if not tomorrow then the next day that is something and lot of things that we think is oh my god what's going to happen today will not matter a year down the line or two years down the line i think that is something i keep reminding myself and something i think everyone should do if it's not something that probably will uh come back to haunt you two years down the line three years down the line even three months down the line don't spend too much time you know worrying about it now to you know really bottom really uh low moments for me one was the divorce i've already talked about it i looked at it as something i had to do for myself and that is something i mean i know a lot of people who are in really unhappy marriages just because they are scared they are worried what society will say all i have to say is and this is something i think my parents have drilled into my head my sister has drilled into my head that ultimately look at what is going to make you happy those people you are worried about society you are worried about they are not going to come and take care of your kids take care of your unhappy unhappiness it's you so if it's not if you are not happy about something then do something to change it so i took that big step my family was with me all the way through um my kids daughter was just 1 year old and then i went on to marry this amazing man you know vijay if i had not made that decision that life changing decision because of fear of society or what's going to happen i wouldn't have married the second time and uh he's an excellent father to my kids um very very supportive to everything i do so I mean I forgot your question what was <laughs> the original question was The question but, question is about how do you know that at the bottom of the barrel of yes, the moment yes. you can still recalibrate to understand that if you accept this yeah. and then make the changes the only way up yes only so, direction is going Yeah so at that point I did not have the it I was still very young I didn't have the wisdom to know all of that so it was all done with two three intentions one is to make sure my kids are happy i didn't know i'll marry again i was all set to be a single mom raising my kids by myself but i knew that i was making the right decision um and uh but now when i look back yes i mean that was a very low point in my life but since then i have only where relationships are concerned whether it's with my kids for my kids and with uh, from a marriage perspective it's just been upward so yeah i mean sometimes you just need to make that difficult decision um and support having that family support i think is that's where the lifeboat comes yeah yeah absolutely. family is a form of lifeboat absolutely. there was a second moment that you were talking about that i'm still not <laughs> ready to talk about um so then we we'll avoid it yeah so my so dad i know about it yeah my i lost my dad uh, so i'll we'll avoid it but the idea of understand see again one of the most difficult things like you spoke about is to say that yes now i accept this is the situation let's move forward from here so that's where the essence of eternal optimism comes in take this to your experience with founders and from your personal learnings if you have to now give some advice to these young founders who are facing failure for the first time in their lives it may be and perhaps at that point i am realizing that oh everything is lost but hardly do they realize that that's their first failure absolutely and they'll have several more yeah. how and where and what advice would you give to these founders based on your experience 
to recalibrate the mindset to say that the best thing in life at times to happen is to reach that bot bottom of the barrel moment and recognize it. Yeah, I think this is a very pertinent question, especially in the current environment, because we are seeing a lot of this happening, right? I mean, founders struggling, companies struggling. Um, it's it's exactly this that whatever I said till now, whatever you said till now is failures are a part of life. It depends on how you look at them, uh, and. Especially where founders are concerned, I think they just need to look around them and they'll see enough and more examples of founders failing many times and then suddenly just hitting jackpot and doing so well for themselves. So in life, you should you have to take failure as a, as a learning, as something from where you have to learn, you have to feel those emotions, take a break, deal with it. You have to feel it. You can't just be in denial and move on. You have to feel it. Get up and get going again. That's the only way you, you can deal with life. I mean, even today when I think of all the major uh, you know, problems I have faced, my family has faced, or even you have faced, my friends have faced, I feel the only reality in life is these problems just keep coming. There is no end to them and I have learned to accept that. Be happy in spite of them, in spite of these problems, these failures and find find reasons to be happy in little things, little, little events in your life. Accept failure, learn, get up, move on. I think that's the only way to survive. True. There is. And what powerful. are your thoughts on this? See, I think. You uh, also see so yeah. Many. I think. I think. Uh, there are two mindsets, right? One is, you don't have an option but to be an eternal optimist, because if you're building something, you have gone outside the usual regular course of downside protection. You know that there is no safety net other than your lifeboat. Yeah. And your lifeboat is again, as we discussed, there could be people, there could be family, there could be perceptions, there could be your mindset. But when you have that mindset to say that you have to be eternally optimist, the other bit that you have to factor in also is to say that, can I celebrate the small joys, the small success? A lot of people, you know, in their long term vision of trying to build something very large, they lose out on the small moments yeah. of joy. And I actually learned this from Archana. There, you know, I, I used to have this mindset, um, you laugh. I used to have this mindset because I come from a background which is mid-middle class. And I keep saying this, it's a very funny cusp zone because you're neither poor that you're hopeless and you're definitely not rich. So you don't have anything. So you're in this ever aspirational zone when you're growing up. Your mindset is to qualify from the two-wheeler to the four-wheeler to get to that next level because you don't have enough and you're always trying to build things in, right? And that's where a lot of hacks of jugar, mindset, ability to do things, hustle, which we'll talk a little in detail later. But all of these come inside you. What that also does is it takes away from you the power of emotion. It makes you very stoic. And when you become so stoic, you realize that you're just focused on that goal so much that you've forgotten the entire journey. Mm. You've forgotten those milestones that you covered in the journey. You've forgotten those achievements that you ma managed. I'll give a small example. There are a lot of achievements that I'm very proud of, but I'll give a tangible achievement because, you know, a lot of people understand when they see an achievement as against emotional achievements of building an organization. So when I was growing up, for me, the whole thought process of having a four-wheeler was very uh, aspirational. Mm -hmm. Again, I also come from the eastern part of the country and one of the things there that you see with certain family members who have really arrived is that they would have a four-wheeler in the form of a Mercedes-Benz. Mm -hmm. And that was the epitome of having a four-wheeler. It was 
ईस्ट में मर्सिडीज ऑलवेज हैड द बिगर बिगर बॉय स्टेटस कम्पेयर टू द अदर टू जर्मन कंपेरेटिव वाइल आई नो यूर एन ऑडी फैन बट द होल थॉट प्रोसेस वॉज दैट इफ यू रीच द यू अराइव एंड दैट इज द एंड ऑल सो फ्रॉम चाइल्ड हुड इन माई माइंड आई हैड द थिंग दैट वन डे आई विल गो अक्रॉस एंड ओन इट एंड आई कैप्ट विद दैट एम इन लाइफ ड्यूरिंग माई अर्ली डेज ड्यूरिंग माई हसल डेज ड्यूरिंग माई यू नो law firm days to even when i started vertices 7 years ago my vision and my aim was very clear that i want to build and some day own it to say that you've harvested a dream like this for 20 odd years means that when you achieve that dream it's supposed to be life changing yeah. i still remember i achieved that dream 5 years ago i went and bought that car I drove that car from the showroom to the house and my emotion for that car was over. And suddenly I realized that now I need to think about what next. So I did not celebrate that moment. I did not enjoy that moment. I did not let that moment settle in. And this is a tangible example I'm giving because a lot of people mark success basis what you can see. So there's so many things that I would not celebrate. because for me it was always that larger goal and that's one day when you know archana told me that you're going to lead a very unhappy life yeah if you continue to be stoic the way you are because stoicism beyond a point also becomes your biggest let sinker yeah. and that's the day i realized that the smallest of joys need to be celebrated the smallest of successes need to be celebrated the smallest of milestones need to be celebrated so my view again if i have to discuss this because I've been blessed to advise so many founders. I've been blessed to work with so many investors. I always say that no matter what that small milestone is, celebrate it. It's a win because trust me tomorrow there's a loss. And you have to deal with that loss. So mental sanity to deal with that failure has to be there for you to celebrate this moment. So a lot of people lose that out. No, I'm a big one for celebrating. My kids get irritated sometimes. They are like, you know, enough for everything I'm like Oh we have to celebrate this every small thing so I am totally someone who really but yeah it that also came with age I I wasn't I think we are all very ageist now <laughs> <laughs> I think the good part good part about this podcast I keep saying this I love saying it has come with age yeah, I know <laughs> even though mentally you're 25 years old I am yeah, yeah. mentally i'm 50 <laughs> but uh, I think the good part of 40 something sitting together and talking is uh there's actual experience there's actual depth and hopefully we have done something in life to be able to share unlike a lot of other examples of uh, podcasts which is around the country right now where people are talking about a lot of things without actually achieving so for me the essence of this is to get true achievers i want to discuss two very important things but i don't want to discuss it here i want to discuss in that beautiful terrace garden of yours because you know you have a flamboyant garden and i come from uh, a lovely city called mumbai where um, you know the size of your um, cabins and your bathrooms are sizes of our 1 bhk is <laughs> there so let's enjoy that garden let's sure. take that there but let's pick up on two very interesting traits the power of jugar and the essence of hustle are they interconnected are they overrated or are they underestimated so while you think about this and you give me your thought process let's head towards the garden and tell me while we sit in that beautiful place what do you think of this because these two hacks i have seen lot of people talk a lot about some actually speak without understanding some speak with excess understanding which can also be dangerous so you have had the eagles eye view of seeing this shape out in various businesses so i want your thought on this the power of jugar and the essence of hustle is it overestimated or is it underestimated sure shall we yeah all right <laughs> the most powerful and the most underrated yeah so cut so there's a squirrel there yeah so we have squirrels and monkeys here 
Hang on, monkeys will come. Shall we? As long as you didn't refer to me as well. No. <laughs> So now that we have covered an incredible amount of distance from that last lovely spot to this even more amazing a spot and with all the beautiful greenery around, I am sure you've thought or managed to think a lot about your answer. So tell us, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question if, you've, if, you're, going to, if you're going to ex take the excuse that you've forgotten. Tell us in your mind again, the difference between the essence of Jugaad versus whether hustle is overestimated or underestimated. What's your take in this? I wish I could say I've forgotten the question. I won't let you. <laughs> okay, so... I'll hound you. I'll respond to that my way. Um, Jugar, I think, is ingrained in us Indians. I agree. Uh, again, Jugar, hustle, whatever, we need that to succeed. But my... Uh, Direct answer to your question would be, I do think hustle is overrated. I also think there is some confusion these days around the concept of hustle. What does it really mean? Okay. So. What does it really mean? According to you? If you ask me, uh, hustle is not necessarily good. Always, right? But uh, Go a little deeper on that. What do you mean by that? Is it because of the connotation of the word? Or yes. is it because of something far deeper? No, as in I, I do think that traditionally speaking at least uh, when you say hustle you would think of shortcuts or way of doing things avoiding hard work. Or maybe showing something which actually isn't. Yes, exactly. But I also feel that uh, these days people are a little confused in the sense uh, plain, simple, good, old-fashioned hard work is being referred to as hustle many times probably because it's just become very cool to say he's a hustler you know, cool to use the term hustle I don't know what it is I do feel that there, there is some confusion. That, that's all I'm willing to say. What do you think? It doesn't matter. <laughs> in this podcast, I am asking. Uh, we'll, we'll answer in your podcast, whenever you have one. But, see, hard work, as we established earlier, is a given base. Absolutely. I mean, there's no two ways about it. You have to. But a lot of times, even after you do all the hard work, it may not have that slight differentiator. One way to look at it, and if I'm giving you the other thought, which could very well exist, one way to look at it is that that differentiator, that USP, is what hustle is about. Absolutely, I totally agree with you and that is why you need that middle path. You need hustle. I, I started say with that, that you need hustle to succeed, I think. But you need to, I, I don't know how to uh, say this, but you need to walk that middle path where you don't overdo it. Or only hustle. Or only hustle, exactly. So but fundamental is what very, matters. Yeah, absolutely. And it has to be a good combination. And it's at times difficult to find that combination because yeah. it's very circumstantial. Yeah. This takes me to another thought, which um, to a great extent is greatly debated about today, especially given some situations and scenarios. And that term is FOMO. And the beauty about FOMO is that it's extremely neutral in terms of the person getting it. You could have the founder having a FOMO. You could have the investor having a FOMO. You could have an individual having a FOMO. You could have an institution having a FOMO. This entire element of FOMO has been taken into another level altogether where 
a lot of times it's also said that deal making closure of a deal to a great extent is relying on how fomo is managed so deal making is about fomo management to a great extent i believe that because if you manage it well it's a win win for both parties yeah. and i also believe a deal is a deal for everyone if you have a one sided deal then there are other problems that come into uh, surface but let's go into a little bit of granular detailing about what your interpretation of fomo is and your advice to our viewers where a lot of them could either be young founders or young investors how do they manage internal fomo see um i personally am against fomo it does come at times but what do you mean you're against FOMO? against meaning as even within our team i think that is something we always keep telling ourselves that our decisions our uh, wish to invest in a certain sector or in a, or going behind a certain founder or a certain company will never be driven by fomo and like you said we see a lot of that happening there is a herd mentality there is this fear of missing out all the time especially these days right and we make a conscious effort to stay away from it this is on the professional front and i think that is something we tell our founders as well so when you say you make a constant effort to stay conscious away from effort. it and a conscious effort to stay away from it what happens when as a result of that something could result in an anti portfolio and you could have a huge regret that had you pursued it at that point of time you perhaps would have had the term sheet over four other guys who were in the rat race so we are very clear in this uh, and it has happened we have uh, not invested in several sectors or companies or missed out on certain investment opportunities because we have not followed this uh, mentality uh, i don't think there are any regrets at all there are some learnings there are some thoughts on maybe we could have done something differently but i don't think and this is something ash has he's he constantly keeps telling us that fomo is bad plus this you know just because everyone is doing it there is no need to you know feel that pressure and go there have been years when we have not made a single investment our fund size that's the reason we keep it at a manageable size because you know pressure do to deploy want to have that pressure so like i said there is a conscious effort and even amongst our younger team members where there's more peer pressure right other funds uh, you know talking about uh, this investment that investment so we are constantly reiterating that fomo is not good that should not be the reason we are doing something or not doing something so that's from a investor hat yeah now drive this into personal and therefore if you have to advise some founders what do they take away from fomo because founders also have a lot of fomo absolutely and a lot of times fomo makes them take perhaps a wrong call yeah. which in the long term hurts much more i'll give a case in point example yeah. because of maybe certain third party constructs about a partner a founder may choose and say that this is something that will help me greatly because i am relying a lot on the intangible along with the tangible hmm. but maybe enough due diligence was not done on the intangible capital and as a result when that person came on the cap table and the valuation was perhaps 10 basis points lower than someone who did not showcase that intangible element hmm. in the long run the founder loses out on the valuation and also does not see that intangible capital coming in i am a firm believer and a firm advocate to say that intangible capital matters far more than tangible but a lot of times that also is negative because it creates that fomo where founders believe that there is something which they can get access to but it actually is not existing so how do you how do you advise and what would you advise founders to have in terms of a mindset to deal with this so this is something we face all the time um 
वन इज ऑफ कोर्स वैल्यूएशन वॉट यू मैंशन लॉट ऑफ टाइम स्टैट्स द अट्रैक्शन इंस्टेड ऑफ लुकिंग एट द इंटेंजिबल्स विच लाइक यू सैड आर यूजली फार मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट दे गो फॉर द नंबर और द फैक्ट दैट इट्स अ बिग इन्वेस्टर दे फॉर यू नो लॉट मोर वैल्यूएबल मे बी बट वन थिंग अगेन वी कीप टेलिंग आर फाउंडर्स इज ए we as investors do so much diligence on you guys and your company it is even more important for you guys to go out there and do the reference checks and diligence on us are we the right fit for your company are we the right fit for you and especially like for us because we go in so early stage a lot of times it's just a chemistry between us and our founder so that connection is very important and once we are in for the next round any new investor coming in the automatic tendency is to go for the higher valuation or the larger fund name. or investor larger name exactly so uh, the one thing we keep repeating sometimes uh, the founders listen to us sometimes they don't and there have been again consequences because of that uh, because it does not turn out to be what they had expected that big name to be or that big valuation to be but uh, what we keep saying is valuation number yes of course you shouldn't t- you know take something which you think is totally unreasonably low but at the same time if you feel there is a connection with the investor you feel there is a lot more um, intangible value that they are bringing to the table that's the investor you need to need to go with not because you know someone said your friend who is also a founder has got a large name on their cap table and therefore you also want that that should not be the and that fomo is one of the worst factor. things to do absolutely in fact a lot of people don't understand that even a relationship between the investor and the founder is like a marriage oh yeah so it is it is it is a about long term partnership so yeah. you have to look at it as a partner but you also have to look at so many intangibles that come into play you should be able to like good news okay but when you have bad yeah. news when you're going through a rough time you should be able to pick up the phone and have that frank talk or even a venting session yeah. with your investor that's the kind of relationship you like they keep saying this and i'm sure you played this role because i know how you are and innately that emotion comes out of you uh they say a lot of times a good investor is a good therapist to the absolutely yeah and you as it is have this essence of being very motherly so i'm sure you played the role of therapist to several founders of yours but i want to now take an extrapolate one more aspect which i think is very important for our viewers to try and uh, you know extrapolate from this in your 12 odd years as an investor you would have seen 50 60 70 portfolios in that also you have seen different portfolios reach different scales different ranges some extremely large some moonshot some building some some maybe not that successful all of them have one common element around them and that is the essence of human capital and therefore the ability to know that what is the right team because in an entrepreneurship venture like you started by saying that your teams one of the usps that you found here was lean team and therefore leanness also ensures that the chemistry and the mindset remains very simple and clean right but when you put that into human capital and when you put that into hiring you have seen several founders hire their l1s l2s l3s some may have been great hires some may have graduated to become even a co-founder tag some may have been very wrong hires now in that experience if you have to come back and extrapolate and for our viewers take those two three points which are absolute must haves in hiring when you look at hiring and when i say you look at hiring you look at hiring vis-a-vis your portfolios and the absolute two three red flags to say that no matter how beautiful the package of that persona is it's an absolute red flag what would that be take us through that hiring mindset so uh firstly i think the point i would like to make is um how important having the right team is 
initially the founder or the founders may start off as just them or maybe with one or two people you know around them but slowly they will realize that they can't do everything Absolute. themselves and there is and they're not supposed to they are not supposed to exactly they need to focus on what is core and what is their speciality so if for instance uh, in the consumer sector you are starting a d2c business and you started you're really good at it you want to go offline now you need to get that expert who has the expertise because you don't so hiring that right team around you early on is very important and also to keep revisiting that because as you scale the needs uh, change correct initially when you're a startup you probably for your social media etc you just need someone some young person who's enthusiastic who knows the right things to say but slowly as you expand your marketing needs will grow you have to hire someone with the right experience for the right uh, you know media etc so those things are important to keep in mind one is to hire the right team then to keep revisiting them as you scale and the reason i made this point is because in our portfolio we have seen whenever the founders uh, for whatever reason and lot of times it is insecurity as well If, beautiful for instance a founder the fear of letting go yes and that fear also that oh i am not good with numbers what if i hire someone that person becomes more important and soon will take over as ceo you know those kind of things uh and our documents don't help because yeah. we try to build in those uh provisions never use but we do have them so those insecurities sometimes uh i think push the founders not to hire uh really good people they sometimes surround themselves with yes men and when they do that that's the most dangerous thing most dangerous so that is something i think they really need to avoid when they are hiring people they need people who are actually skilled for the job and someone who won't be afraid to stand up to them and say that this is wrong we need to change uh, the way you're looking at things and um, as far as red flags go it can be different things right but one thing whether it's i mean whatever kind of organization i feel if you're trying to hire someone who haggles too much initially whether it's for the money or for the equity that's a big so missing missing the bigger picture yes absolutely especially when you're joining a startup i think uh, that's that's a huge red flag so that also shows that the person is not looking at skin in the game with due time uh, exactly exactly so that that's a huge red flag in my mind in any organization interesting because what founders also need to know and i i i really like what you put across as a thought that fear of letting go is such a real fear we see that all the time because also you can't blame the founders or the entrepreneurs so much because for them their baby is everything yes one mindset problem also that happens is that you come with that initially there is reason for it but then over over time and scale as one gets maturity one realizes that that's not the truth but initially you believe that no one can teach you better than your own business yeah and therefore you are completely vested and you should have control over everything whereas the way to succeed is when you start delegating the right l1 that's right only then can you broad base and take it to the next level case in point if i did not have an amazing team at the back end of building the firm along with me the way it is or along with my other co-founders the way it is if i didn't have fantastic partners i don't think i would be able to be sitting here and doing this yes yes for me to be able to do this means i have had those right hires and they have built it to that next level and taken it to that next level to be able to say that i can take that step back to also participate in something which is so dear to my heart no absolutely so those i think matter a lot and it's not just the right team in house i also think and maybe it also comes from the fact that i have a professional background in addition to being in an investment firm now 
I think it's so important to have the right advisors. And I do understand why founders tend to, um, either because they want to save costs, they want to, um, whatever the reason, they don't, they want to just focus on the business and, you know, things like that. They sometimes don't spend the money to engage the right lawyers, to engage the right uh, tax advisors and the every, right bankers. Right bankers, and every time that has happened, I have seen it comes back to bite them. And in a much more expensive. Absolutely. A lot of times they take it as an expense line item, but as a reality yeah. is it's actually an investment. Yes, line. yes, it is, it is. And that is something we try to really tell our founders that it's okay spend that money but you need that support you need to have it done right and correctly and cleanly so that when you're raising funds you don't have to spend so much time creating your data room cleaning up you know your housekeeping items all that stuff and also making sure you have the right uh, advisors by you when you're negotiating your documents because the so investors true. definitely will so and and also Time value of money. Absolutely. The right advisors will also teach you that time value of money is everything because for a founder, it's that treasury management. Every day of delay is impacting the treasury and impacting the business. So when you have things in a place and order and your house is in order, closure is far quicker. Yeah. yeah. So you've preempted one question of mine, which I was as I was going to ask you. So let's first dwell a bit on this and then I have a very interesting question to ask you thereafter. So you spoke about advisors, right? You and I have had the privilege of knowing each other for a while now. Off late, we realized that we actually were on a deal together 15 years ago as well. Yeah, yeah. Which is like crazy, <laughs> right? Um, we predominantly were always on the opposite side. Other than a couple of deals where I think my firm collectively worked as investor councils. But you and I, evolved as friends with no agenda to a relationship which I don't think we can name because it's it's pure friendship. It's where it's brought us to this place. It's brought us to this particular moment. And I personally believe for any individual who's successful, time is the most valuable commodity. And for you to give the time on a weekend, on a Saturday, to the extent that you are and the extent that you have, it fills my heart with warmth to say that there is something that must have gone right in terms of building a relationship, even though we were on the opposite side of the table. So if I want to pick that up and the reason I ask this is because a lot of our viewers may also be young advisors. They're young advisors who are in that journey yeah. of building their own clientele. They're in that journey of creating their own relationships. Mm. I keep getting told by my well-wishers that the more you discuss this, the more you're giving out your trade secrets because there's a reason why I've built the inner circle and my circle of lifeboat the way it is. But I also believe that if I don't share it, then I'm not giving back to the ecosystem. And the more I give back to the ecosystem, the ecosystem grows, the more the ecosystem grows, all of us grow. So if I have to take, get you back to be a little on the nostalgia page of our connect and how it evolved in your mind, and how do you see an advisor move to a level where it's no more transactional, where it's beyond that moment, beyond that deal, beyond that transaction, where it's far deeper with us all the more given that we were opposite. How does a lawyer or a banker or a tax advisor or any professional services advisor move to that next level with his or her client? What happens? Yeah, so. I'll probably combine this with our joint experience plus what I think is important. Uh, if I look back to that particular deal where we first properly interacted on opposite sides, uh, if you remember, there were like we've been struggling to close certain points for several days, and then when you and I finally got onto the call. I believe you pulled forcefully to get on the call. Yes, so it closes. yes, yeah. So uh, we got onto the call and within minutes, all of those outstanding points were resolved. 
right and that is something i really appreciated because uh, you came on that call with a very solution oriented let's get the deal done approach and that is what we need right i mean we need that approach where you're not just fighting a point for to show your client that oh look i negotiate so well you are not there for that you are there to make sure everyone gets a fair deal and to make sure the deal gets done i think that's that's the final I mean, objective i mean without the deal there's nothing yeah you don't have to show what your it's not about ego and it's Absolutely. not about the commas and the full stop yeah yeah so i think that i really appreciated that was a proper real in- interaction and now that you're getting me nostalgic i still remember i think there were eight outstanding points yeah and we took 15 minutes to resolve yeah yeah and then we were scratching our heads saying that our respective teams did not close it for about a week yeah so it was just so which talks really bad about both of us <laughs> but yeah okay so uh yeah so i think that that was a great experience and uh, the other thing again which uh has come true amongst us as well but i have always believed as a service provider as a lawyer i the biggest and now even here the one thing ash keeps telling us right that it's relationships always nothing yeah ultimately it is everything boils down to relationships and i think my most prized clients at nda fox mandel it was ultimately that personal rapport that i had built the work was there i used to do the work i used to work really hard but then i always made that effort to build a personal rapport where the client would always think of me or the firm when you know they come back with a deal and with you and me also that's what happened right i mean it has evolved to a personal relationship so ultimately everything boils down to relationship and making that extra effort personal effort to get to know that person as an individual not just as a client or a service provider i think because you know one of the biggest currencies that people don't realize that you'll take back to the grave is about how beautiful your relationships were with people yeah and they say this it's a beautiful saying that the essence of success is not shown in the amount of crowd you gathered during your lifetime the essence of success truly is shown in terms of the crowd that gathers when you're dead yeah and i think that's where you realize the power of relationships and what you build for me relationship is everything right at the end of the day it's an intangible currency it's a non agenda based currency and to take it back to while it's service provider service recipient it's also something that perhaps you see even in your relationship with your founders absolutely because beyond a point it's not the check anymore that matters to them beyond a point what amrita brings on the table through the peaks and the valleys and more importantly the valleys because that's where that self assertiveness that self belief that requirement to say sab theek ho jayega like what you said it'll all it'll all the, um, it'll all fall in place around your founder and say that yes we are here with you and yeah absolutely And I want to marry this with one thought. Yeah. And this is again very personal that I'm going to ask. Mm. I call this the empathy capital. I also say that once you become an entrepreneur, you get a lifetime membership to a club called the Empathy Club. Whatever you took for granted is not for granted, right? But I've seen and this is again something that I want you to tell me whether it's true or not. I've seen a lot of this currency of empathy far easier and far more stronger and far more available with a woman as against a man do you believe this actually is true do you believe therefore and i'm asking you a very controversial question here do you therefore believe that that empathy actually arises out of all the shit that the woman had to go through to try and get that equal footing to try and get inside that door put the foot in the door be that seat on the table and more importantly get that word heard in that room does therefore hardness in terms of approach directly proportionately increases your empathy 
or is it inversely proportionate that the harder you get as a woman to try and ensure you are there and your voice is heard the lesser your empathy goes in how do you see that shaping up take it through also maybe your personal experience and maybe some experiences vis-a-vis -vis women founders that you've dealt with do you see a difference in their approach as well compared to a male founder yeah so uh, my immediate response would be i do think naturally women have more empathy why do you say so i don't know i i do i have probably seen or maybe they don't feel the need to mask it so much women men at times do feel the need to because their manhood will get questioned yes i it, i mean whatever yeah something like that yeah. maybe i mean like it could be right yeah, it's you, just you, the same you can like, be perceived as weak yes. because you're crying yes just like you said you know maybe i will never admit that i'm nervous yeah. you so same way you know probably there is maybe that maybe i will <laughs> relax maybe at the end of all these <laughs> podcasts yeah so anyway uh, i think but having said that i also know uh ash is considered one of the most empathetic bosses investors persons i mean i have ever met so having said that you know you seen men as well on yes yeah, so i that's why this question that is it more a need to mask it whereas women probably feel more comfortable showing emotions and empathy do you see that amongst founders as well with respect to gender do you see yeah. women founders that you deal with far more empathetic yeah, versus men acknowledging men? that uh, they are worried nervous they are burnt out yes definitely i think women acknowledge that women founders and again this is i'm not saying this is the rule i'm just talking about my own experience everyone talks about their own experience. yeah <laughs> just making sure don't worry you don't uh, caveat forget <laughs> the lawyer hat there's no lawyer hat in this conversation so that that never goes away so yeah so i do think uh, but at, at, i also want to touch upon the other point unfortunately i have seen many women because of the struggles they have had to go through through college through um and these are some well known founders and investors uh and in i'm sure in other professions as well including our legal profession our wonderful legal yes profession. because of the struggle they go through to be heard to get that seat at the table they become bitter and even if they are not really that they start showing themselves as very uh, aggressive not empathetic you know life coach you mean for me personally no i meant for the three there <laughs> <laughs> like you have hardcore notes now you have taken you become a pro <laughs> so i want to ask you another question i i remember you know a very dear friend of mine she has a lot of my heart so she mentioned this statement when i asked her that as a woman when you see another woman in the room but you see a facade you see statements which actually don't make sense you see that extra hard trying as a woman do you acknowledge understand and empathize with that or at that time are you gender agnostic to say that if you're in that table talk sense it doesn't matter whether you're x or y gender how do you deal with it because you would have dealt with several people where maybe they made sense at times and maybe they didn't Did you over empathize because of gender? I don't think so. Or are you gender agnostic about it? I I think I'm totally gender agnostic. And you know these are discussions like Vijay and I keep having all the time and I think to a large extent I'm able to take a middle path where just because you, I'm a woman I shouldn't be playing that card all the time. 
being a man is also not that easy i mean it's extremely difficult yes trust me. i mean you have to always show that nothing matters yes that keeping that you know i'm always practical i'm always strong you know and even like we talk so much about women body shaming what about men i mean they go through similar insecurities but i mean you say something against a woman and immediately there's so much who are about it but men go through similar issues so i think we need to be a little more uh, agnostic yes yes we need to be we have some excellent women founders in our portfolio but we have invested in them because they are great founders not because they are great women founders and that is something we've always stood and that's very powerful because so many of my friends who are founders and women i constantly hear the same message to say that we are entrepreneurs exactly. we don't understand the shri prerna concept yes and i think that's very powerful yeah, yeah so this other friend i was telling you about smriti um when i was chatting with her she came across so powerfully on this same philosophy to say that if you're in that seat if you're on that table irrespective of gender you have to respect that position and you have to talk sense if you're not talking sense you can't expect empathy and in fact if i was in that position and i am treated differently because i'm a woman i would feel insulted i don't want to be treated differently i want to be earning that respect because of what i'm doing because of what i'm saying not because i'm a woman let's bring this to another thought process which to a great extent has been discussed but nobody wants to acknowledge it too much how normal is it to cry i cry all the time how normal is it to cry it sans the gender should we normalize crying in respect of gender is that a I form of expression i think so at least with my son i keep reiterating to him that he needs to show his emotions i think it is extremely important to express emotions at the same time i being it's not because i'm a woman or anything but uh in a professional setting i do try to control my emotions a bit because that's not how you should be functioning and again that's irrespective of whether i am a guy or a girl but otherwise i think crying should be normalized expressing emotion should be normalized we are human beings I and i think it helps relationships a lot it does the moment you start expressing it does it takes away the facade yeah irrespective of what that relationship is whether it's co-founders whether it's partners whether it's an investor founder Absolutely. whether it's spousal it doesn't matter yeah i think expression is at the end of the day the ultimate facade dropper so in this context yeah if i had to synopsize our chat of your journey there are several people and i keep saying this because you're no more a lawyer right you like to still pretend that you're a lawyer i love shareholders agreements <laughs> i really do you pretend that you're a lawyer but i think you do law very well but you do a lot of other things very well so you're you're holistically a you know as i said an entrepreneur in its truest form that's why you're the chief operating officer if we have to draw down two to three learnings across the last 25 years that you have given to creating you're making me feel old now it's okay <laughs> i mean like i just want to make you yeah, realize that sure. you've spent similar time as much as i have <laughs> you know just because you look like a diva doesn't mean that you forget the amount of years that you've spent but tell me um those 2 3 4 depending on how many you think are core to you 25 years of different hats different learnings different situations circumstances and you have literally been baptized by fire personally emotionally professionally and you are where you are you are content and yet not satisfied you are happy and yet you want to achieve more but at the end of the day most importantly you're balancing your sanity 
those are the essences of lifeboat so if i have to draw this into three things one what's your definition of a lifeboat two 25 years of baptism by fire what are those two or three key learnings you want to share with our viewers which you think will hold them good irrespective of whether they are building they are creating they are studying they are learning to go somewhere else they are advising it doesn't matter but maybe some neutral elements three what is that hack to consistently maintain sanity so lifeboat learnings and how do you maintain sanity it's my family uh my dad who's always made me believe that it love you okay. best yeah i'm the best yeah. that i think that's what he used to believe and he was always there for me no matter what yeah. and he still is the aura stays the aura stays forever and um, while i was always i'm still like i'm super close to my dad and you know he is someone i look up to etc it's always been my mom who's like the silent rock who's always kept the family together kept me together um now my children vijay everyone i mean she is this rock in our family i mean we, i think all of us extended family us all of us just turn to her whenever we need that support and a lifeboat like you said and uh, right now i think vijay has become that also because uh, he just supports me like no matter what so without any condition yeah absolutely so yeah so family for sure and of the course. kids are the reason i get up every morning <laughs> kids are everything yeah. kids are yeah, everything yeah so I have a five-year-old who doesn't really acknowledge my presence as much, <laughs> but I'm hoping that yeah, as he yeah. grows up, there will be value. But kids are everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think family is everything, and by that thing, even, and I know it's a cliche to say my team is my family, but in Sama, it's actually like that. Ash is my closest friend, and his family, everyone else in the team. So, I think all of these people together form my. at different moments for different reasons my friends everyone i think and that that's when i come back to the entire circle to say relationships nothing else matters and and that's my uh, biggest uh, i don't think uh, i am uh, i know i should be giving advice but my suggestion to everyone uh, irrespective of profession founder startup whatever it may be is keep that infrastructure around you and by infrastructure, infrastructure. i mean exactly relationships those people who will be with you no matter what and sometimes you don't need definitions for it you don't you don't need definitions you just need those people with you and they can be anyone i think that has always helped me through my professional personal lives you know um very important and i think nowadays uh i especially see the young people when they join workplaces that effort to build relationships etc is not there so for me you know the the leadership for us matters we've grown from literally we've seen days where you know, it was just four of us a 400 square foot office today now 80 odd people three offices three cities and that core still remains the same that essence of being each other's lifeboat still remains the same so i can't i can't disagree with you at all on that let's go to the learnings yeah 25 years of going through baptism by fire two to three learnings which you think will really help our viewers irrespective of which stage which phase what roles they are in their lives there are some things which are neutral what are those learnings according to you so one thing i would say and uh, again i think i started our discussion with this i may get trolled for this but the point is hard work 
nothing beats that you need to work i mean the especially the first few years of your career uh you need to give it your all nowadays i hear a lot about work life balance sure very important you need to have that balance but at the same time you need to make sure you're committed to your work if there's a time we used to do all nighters all the time but that does not mean we didn't have a life we had so much fun we had fun during the yes and we would go out and party we would i mean my best memories of my life are at nishidesa associates and at fox mandal as well and uh, we worked really hard and because of that hard work that we put in now we are at a stage where if i ask for flexibility at work or i ask for whatever i know i will get it because i have reached that re- level yeah i have earned it just like you can now make the time to do all this why because you put in that you know those years of just unbelievable hard work i mean you have to do it that that i really really believe in so i think that's um, and by hard work i also mean smart working i don't mean you just keep slogging day and night kolu ka bell thodi na banda absolutely so smart working so i think that's one big big uh, learning nothing can beat that uh, that was more on the work front but generally um, as far as life is concerned and uh, these are things i've already talked about uh, but two things that i would say one is stop thinking about what will people say what will society say you have your core group your core relationships yes don't hurt them but other than that nothing should matter you know what that person will say this person will say no you have to do what makes you happy what you think is right and uh, forget about that constant fear of oh my god what will that person say what will they say if i don't carry this brand what will happen if i don't drive this car no i think it's very important to focus on what is important for you what will make you happy so yeah i mean focus on what makes you happy i think these two three learnings more than enough yeah yeah i am sure let's talk about mental sanity yeah. i i think it's extremely important and a lot of people don't want to talk about a lot of things around it tell us your version of mental sanity so i mean talking about mental sanity what i think uh and this is very recent right like i said earlier i wasn't always in my head at least so accepting and okay with things uh it has taken a lot and uh what i think has really helped me one is of course what i've already talked about just the just accepting going with the flow and constantly reminding yourself that there is another day you will get up you will move on you will survive you know this is not don't think that this is the end it's never the end so i think just that belief and that constant reminder every night has the following yes so that has helped me a lot um secondly i think again something we already touched upon me time being selfish making sure no matter how busy you are take that much time that you need to just get back your energy Uh, don't think you're being selfish because you're not you need that time to yourself uh to be able to come back and give it your 100% 200% again whether it's to your family to your work to your friends yeah. whoever it may be so uh that me time to do things that's just for yourself even if it is just sitting here and just <laughs> not doing anything reading a book yeah whatever maybe a fictional book Yeah. <laughs> so But you you're so right because it's it's again it's personal downtime. People yeah. people undermine the value of downtime. Absolutely. That's important. And thirdly, um 
something that's very close to my heart something that till very recently was considered a stigma especially in our society but now thankfully people are being more open about it talking a lot more openly about it and that's therapy having a therapist so true i think it is so important uh it's not something to be ashamed of i am in fact very proud that i do have a therapist it is just someone i can go and talk to someone who's not connected to me not related to me someone who'll just listen sometimes otherwise you know you end up putting a lot of pressure on your existing relationships like if i expect vijay on top of everything else to also sit down and listen to my entire day non stop what my emotions are it's expecting too much from that one person or two three people in your life so you need that person that therapist who you can go to you don't need to go through i believe it's not necessary that you need to reach a mental low to Absolutely. have a therapist i feel you should have a therapist as a prevention as well tertiary care as against primary absolutely i think i'm smiling because um, again quite a few things you preempted in this chat of ours one of the things that you preempted was which i would have asked you by you yourself made this statement but on quite a few episodes i've actually discussed this and to say that and more so from a founder perspective to say that when we deal with so many things right and as an entrepreneur every day there is a new fire every day there's a new crisis every day we are trying to just manage that crisis and live up to that particular day's battle so that we can find the next battle it takes a huge toll on yeah so on quite a few occasions i ask people that do you think as founders we are so mind numbed we are so mentally screwed that we undermine the power of therapy mm. and like you couple of others have bravely come out on the podcast on the live boat to turn around and say that they actually underwent therapy and that also is a part of their life boat yes so i don't know whether you know this but uh, in vertices when we were you know when we had reached a stage after 2 3 years of and you always know the 1000 day test is where you realize yeah. whether things are on this side of the line or on the other yeah. side you know the difference between green and black and the funny part is when we reached that stage we we took two to three measures as human capital measures and we didn't talk too much about it but it, some of them really went out on their own and became pretty popular we became the first firm the first law firm in the country to create a concept called menstruation leave policy for all our women colleagues yes you had mentioned that yeah. parallelly we became one of the first firms in the country to have an in-house counselor again for the same reason what you're speaking about that our jobs are confrontational we are fighting for other people's rights right for me of course now i look at it more holistically as an entrepreneur yeah. but if you look at the micro element of people right there in the think thick of things they're fighting for other people's rights all the time there's a time when you get burnt out and you want to talk to someone without being judged yeah so i think that's what this does what you're saying that when you want to just be heard when you just want to talk to someone without being judged at times it and there are two ways of looking you can go to a medically qualified therapist at times even somebody who could be that silent listener also acts as a pseudo therapist but what both of these do is it creates that balance in the mind mm. to say no matter what happens they'll all fall in a row they'll all align themselves akhir mein sab theek ho jayega and that akhir mein sab theek theek ho jayega is the essence of eternal optimism yeah because as long as you know that at the end everything is going to fall in the right place all the ducks are going to get in a row you will manage it you will take it to the next level yeah. so i think that is the most powerful thing and i'm i'm so proud of you that knowing someone who rarely comes in front of the camera knowing someone who would not talk in any occasion unless there's a gun to her head but to honor the friendship to honor the relationship that we have to honor that compartmentalized life and that role without definition that we share with each other to be here and to open up at this level i'm grateful uh it's been an honor it's been a pleasure 
and i'm so glad that there's so many people who will take away so much of learning from this podcast to say that anything is possible looking at you a person can turn around and say anything is possible i can wear the hat of a service provider i can wear the hat of an entrepreneur i can wear the hat of an entrepreneur i can wear the hat of an investor because you managed all the roles beautifully so kudos to you for that and i'm very proud of you and i'm very thankful to you honestly for spending a saturday evening talking about things that really matter to you talking about things that are so deep talking about things which perhaps are also very emotional which you would have never touched and all because of the friendship that we share so i'm very grateful i hope you had fun yes i i really uh, i i forgot that there were cameras in between i guess uh but i really enjoyed this talk at some level it has also been therapeutic but and also at many levels there are certain things which i feel very strongly about and i'm glad i've been able to voice it and i hope at least some people some learn some people learn and my my philosophy is that i and i know how beautifully big this is going to be hopefully i'm as i said eternal optimist but my philosophy is that even if one person changes and benefits out of this i think we are successfully doing something did you like this concept do you think this is going to be something which is worthwhile absolutely absolutely i'm so glad you're doing this and good luck for the remaining so now at the end of the segment there's a very very interesting <laughs> very original never been thought before concept by my team which is termed as lifeboat shots Okay. Okay. And uh, I know that you really try to bribe the team to get these answers. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, but or other these questions unsuccessfully. Unsuccessfully. Um uh, so the concept of liveboat shots is rapid fire. Uh there are no shots. We've had enough of our coffee. Yeah. So we'll go straight to this. I know and I therefore I don't have to tell you this uh, because everything that you say you say from your heart. So till now everything that you've said you've spoken from your heart. So don't use your brain here. Continue with your heart. but this is fun segments right so rapid fire instantaneous let's go shall we what is that one hidden... i'm really scared <laughs> yeah okay what is that one hidden talent that you have which even your family members don't know about if i uh, reveal that here it won't be hidden anymore that's the idea that's the idea make them do things and make them feel that they are the ones who are doing it and not me making them do it manipulation <laughs> <laughs> if you could travel anywhere right now where would you go italy what's the best piece of advice that you have ever received i have already talked about it my dad saying all the time just put your head down and work don't worry about the results or the reward input 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 yeah. output will happen on its own and he didn't just mean in terms of career yeah. even Everywhere. in terms of relationships and anything. anything it's always about the input yeah. output and the throughput automatically gets calculated yeah. if your life was a movie what genre would it be karan johar full on drama everything large scale lot of dancing very bollywood huh? yeah totally bollywood like rocky or any style yeah what's the weirdest food you've ever tried that's difficult i don't try cockroach oh no no no, no? i i don't try weird food what's a hobby that you've always wanted to try dancing hmm. i did join shamak in between didn't follow through but i will one day okay What's the most used app on your phone? I somehow know the answer up to this, <laughs> for which it's now not used. Yes, but it was Instagram, and then I logged out ten days back. I'll get back on soon. Yeah, I'm sure. If you could have any superpower for one day, what would it be, and why? Superpower. Can the effect last like? That depends on your mental prowess. Super. It's one day. depends on the impact you create do something that will make my kids lives happy forever i don't know how i'll achieve that because that's the constant worry i have how do i protect them from is that a good thing to do it's not it's not it's not good at all but 
I have, I, if somehow I could just make sure, guarantee that their lives are just happy, I will do anything for that. That's a mother speaking. Yeah. But uh, again, you know, every time you say these things, I get into my philosophical depth. <laughs> it's and I not think, good. It's not good. I mean, like you will never understand the value of yeah, happiness yeah. unless you've gone through I a little bit that. of I the other that. side of the emotion. So maybe it's not a good thing to do. It's not. It's not. But yeah. yeah. But what's your go-to comfort food? I go think this also have an idea about. No, no, no. My go-to comfort ice food ice cream is no. No, thank God. It's this thing we call marbhat. Ah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's overcooked rice with chana, pickle. So we have a uh, it's an, an Assamese, Assamese local dish. Yes, yeah. and we have an Assamese lemon, kaji nemo. So you give me that, I can eat that for every meal. What's the last thing that you do before going to bed? These days, I think of my dad. Who would you like to see in the next season of Lifeboat as a guest? Who would you like to recommend? Because I'll hold you to it. You will have to invite the person. Oh, can I say myself? Not second time, people get bored. Why co coffee with Karan? People come every season. Oh, I realize, I realize you're influenced by <laughs> Karan, but uh, I have to add more value, no? <laughs> I would have learned more by the next I'm season. I'm sure. Um, let me think. I have a feeling some very interesting name is going to come out. Yeah. I think the kind of questions you've asked, I would love, uh, you know Kapil Chopra, right? Postcard founder, Easy Diner founder. I would love to hear his answers to all of this. He's a very dynamic founder. All right. Very interesting person. He was the president of Oberoi for the longest time. I would love to hear his answers. I so think we'll hold a you. Lot to learn. We'll hold you to sending the invitation on. Absolutely, behalf. yeah. But it's been a pleasure. Thank yeah, you, Amrita. Same. I really or should I call you Amy now that we are <laughs> at the end of the conversation? I can get back to our sure. friendship car, Amy. Thanks so much, my dear. I really appreciate. There's another very original thing you have to do. Uh, there is a mug. <laughs> See, I told you. Coffee and, with currants. So I have to come back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, write something. Sign it. Someday, I'll auction it. <laughs> there you go. I hope you had fun. I did. I did. You've written a book. <laughs> All right. With love and best wishes, rock on. See, so rock that's on. what we the have. Bollywood reference. Bollywood reference has away. to say. Yeah. So that's what we have, folks. That's Amrita Barthakur from Sama Capital. This is Vinayak Berman. I hope you have not seen this episode as much as I have seen it. Like this much as I have seen it, I have seen it as much as I And if you think this adds value to your life, if you think this will teach you something, if you think this will help you to learn and create something in your lives, then go across and like, subscribe, share and comment. It will mean the whole world to me and my friends. If you don't have time to watch the entire podcast, then do subscribe to Vinayak Berman Clips and Vinayak Berman Shots, where we take out the most relevant extracts, the most important extracts of those podcasts, of those stories, of those moments for you and for your benefit, so that you can try and understand the gist of the whole conversation and yet take a lot of learning home. Till we see you next time, signing off, Vinayak Berman.